let's continue our investigation of standard circuit elements. Um, so what we want to do here, and what we started to do in the previous video, is kind of develop implementations of important building blocks that are used in, in networks, computers, etc. So the multiplexer, which combines n sources onto one wire, an encoder, which determines which of a series of inputs is active, and the decoder, which converts a binary input to one of n wires. Good, let's start with the decoder. So the decoder is used to select one of two to the n outputs based on n input bits. Okay, so the input is size n, output is two to the n, and only one of these outputs is active at any given time. So a decoder that has n inputs and m outputs is referred to as an n to m decoder. For example, as shown in this graph, a three to eight decoder. So there are three control inputs here at the bottom and then eight outputs d0 to d, uh, d7. Good, so that's the device that we want to build. And you know, I, as usual, I would recommend before listening to me, think a little bit about how you would actually realize a system like that using standard and, and OR gates. But here's the system. So let's build a two to four um, decoder. So there's two inputs, S1 and S0. And we said that only one of the outputs is supposed to be active for every any specific configuration. So the truth table is relatively obvious. It's just going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. So for combination, input combination 0, 0, then wire D0 is active. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. OK, so this is a very simple circuit. And of course, if you uh, draw the circuit diagram, it kind of looks something like that. I'm just going to draw this with the input um, S1 here and S0 here. And I'm just going to provide the not S0 and not S1. And then each of these outputs here is really just an AND gate. So this is D3, D2, D1, and D0. All right, so D3 is AND of S1 and S0. So it's this. D2 is the AND of S1 and not S0. D1 is the AND of um, not S1 and S0. And then D0 is the AND of not S1 and not S0. OK, this is really simple. So I guess the question now for you is, I mean, do you see a potential issue with the device and one way to think about it is sort of in the context of um, the phone system that we introduced in the previous video. And there we essentially said that, OK, th the way the decoder is going to be used is by the, um, the operator who puts in a code. And once he put in the code, the phone will ring or the bell will ring in somebody's office, right? The, the wire here. D3, D1, D2, that connect to the bells in the different offices, and one of them will be true. As you can see with this system, is that one bell will always ring. In this particular case, since we gave the engineer the code or the phone number 00, basically the default is that if nothing else is done, the phone will ring in the engineer's office. And that's problematic. So how do you fix this? Well, the answer is you actually build an enabled decoder. So you add one additional input, <coughs> which is this enable input, which if it is set to 0, we're just assuming that the whole system is off. So we'll just put zeros everywhere here. And so if enable is, is false, then None of the wires is true. If enable is true, the system should just act like a standard decoder.
Okay, and if you have that, then the problem is effectively solved. So only when the operator sort of enables the decoder does and puts in the, the code does somebody actually get um, called. And I'm not going to read out the whole thing, but the way to realize this is essentially by just adding together um, by adding together an enable input with the other inputs, right? So you have an enable input here. This is enable. If enable is true, the whole system acts as a decoder. If enable is false, um, nothing happens at all. So that's a useful um, element. So what does a decoder or an able decoder look like in Verilog? So let's, again, stick with this example of a 2 to 4 um, decoder. So here's the code. So we have an output. Um, in this particular case, it's a, it's a, it's a register with four um, bits, because right, there's four output wires. The input, um, there's, it's a two-bit number. Um, and there's also an input that's called enable. And one way to realize this is essentially by saying, so it's a, it's a combinational logic element, so it's always at star begin. And now we're going to say, we're going to use an if statement. We're going to say if enable. Right, so only if enable is true. And now we're going to just go through the different possibilities, the different cases for the input sort of case by case. And I'm going to use this statement case of in. And I'm going to say the first case is that the input is a 2-bit binary number 0, 0. In that case, the colon out is the 4-bit binary 0, 0, 0, 1. Semicolon. And then, of course, the next case would be you know, 0, 1. In that case, out is 4, B0010, etc. OK? End case. Then, else, so if, if enable is not true, essentially, our output is just going to be 0. Okay, and then end mo module. So that's a really simple way of realizing an enabled decoder in Verilog using um, a case statement. Good, so the next circuit element that we want to look at is the encoder. So it kind of performs the inverse operation of decoder. So the input now are two to the n or fewer wires, and only one of the input wires is, is asserted at any given time. Um, and the output is n output lines. So the function is essentially that the output is the, the binary representation of the ID of the input line that's asserted. So remember again in the, in the example of the, the phone system, it's like somebody presses the bell and that results in that person's phone number being displaced, uh, dis displayed to the operator. <coughs> Good, so this is effectively the truth table. I mean, it's not quite complete, but that's kind of the interesting cases, right? So we're assuming here that only one output is true at any given time. And for each of the possible wires, we have a code that we're going to display. So if you just go with this simplified version here, you might say that the, the logic function for A1 here is simply D2 or D3, while the logic function for A0 is D1 or D3. OK, so the circuit diagram that you could draw here is really simple. It's just two OR gates. 
here. This is a 1. This is a 0. The D3 input is shared. And then here you have D2. And here you have D1. Good. So that's an encoder. Now, what, what are the issues with this? Right? And again, think about it for one second, because it's kind of interesting. There should be two things that you observe that are somewhat tricky. And again, I'm going to do this sort of in the context of, of the, our phone system. <coughs> so the first issue is that when no one calls, there is a code that gets bit displayed, and it's 0, 0. Right? So the impression that the system generates is that the, the engineer is permanently trying to call the operator. The second thing that happens is that when D2 and D1 call, so that I think that was the, um, the mailroom and the vice president, the code that gets displayed is 1-1. One, one. So if D2 and D1 are true, then the code that gets displayed is 1-1, one, one, which actually looks like the CEO is calling, even though she or he isn't. <coughs> so now the next question is kind of how can we fix these two issues? Okay, and this is essentially how we're going to do it. We're going to build a priority encoder. So we're going to use priorities to resolve the problem of two or more input lines being active at the same time. Um, and in this particular case, we're going to choose a scheme where the highest ID that's active wins. Um, we're also going to add an output to identify when at least one input is active. Good. So that last bit is relatively straightforward, right? So here we have now have actually a complete truth table in some ways. And what we're going to say is that if no one calls, then um, we want to make sure that this valid output is 0. If someone calls, then you know the call is valid. So this output here tells us whether someone's calling or not. Um, and then here, we're going to say that the following is true, that if D3 is calling, so if there's a 1 in the, in the highest order bit, we actually don't care what anybody else is doing. We're just going to display the code 1-1. One, one. Then the next case is like if D3 is not calling, but D2, D2 is calling, then that sort of ID wins. And we're going to ignore everything else. And then we can complete this sort of using the same logic. Right? So here we're just saying that whoever has the highest ID, that ID will be displayed. And this device here is referred to as a priority encoder. <coughs> so we're not going to design it here, but you can imagine that it's also, or you can do it as an, as an exercise for yourself. Um, and for example, check with, with the book that we're using um, to make sure that you get that right. But it's basically a very simple combinational design problem. So the last device that I, that I want to introduce, and by far the most important um, for building circuits going forward, is the multiplex. And of course, we, we have seen examples of a 2 to 1 multiplex already in the class and the lab. But now I just want to do it a bit more generally. So a multiplex is an element that selects data from one of many input lines and directs it to a single output line. So the input Again, 2 to the n input lines and n selection lines output the data from one of the selected input lines. Okay, And the multiplexer is typically abbreviated as, as MUX. And the symbol is something like this. So let me draw this nicely. It's a shape like that here. Um, we're going to call this a 4 to, or we're going to do the, the design here a four or draw a 4 to 1 MUX. So there's one output, there's one, two, 
three, four inputs. Codes one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And then there's two control lines, S1 and S0. Okay, that's the symbol. That's the truth table. It's a bit unusual in the same in the sense that what I'm drawing here is I'm saying that if S1 and S, for example, in the case where S1 and S0 are both zero, the output function is D0. So it's whatever data is coming in on the corresponding wire. <coughs> and if you um, use this to design the circuit, you may hopefully find that it could that the function f should look something like this so you have you can consider this case by case so not s1 and not s0 and d0 that's the first row and it basically says well if s1 and s not s0 um, if s1 and s0 are 0 then this here will be true so this will be 1 and hence, 1 and d0 is just d0. And so going on, next case, not s1 and s0 and d1, or s1 and not s0 and d2, or s1, s0, d3. OK, so in each of for every possible, any possible combination of the input values, you pick one of these four terms, and then f is just whatever the value of data is. What's interesting is we'll see that we also can do essentially general logic with a multiplexer. So briefly solve this problem for yourself. So think about how you would realize the function f with an 8 to 1 multiplexer. So f is essential. So the first thing you might want to do is to just write down the truth table of f. So you have x, y, and z. And this is f, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. OK. And if you do this correctly, you should get that this is the function 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay? Now, if you want to take this truth table and realize it with a multiplexer, take this function and, and realize it with a multiplexer, well, all you have to do is to essentially just take the values of f here and just put them on the inputs of this multiplexer. So then, and then put x, y, and z, so the, the variables, on the controls. And so, of course, if I'm choosing, for example, x, y, and z to be all 0, I'm picking the data on this zeros on the wire 0 here, which is a 0. And so f produces the correct value for this function. <coughs> so this is quite neat, and it's very straightforward. So you can take any truth table of size n and directly realize it with a multiplexer of the same size doing you know general logic but I think what's even neater is that you can also realize um, the same function like an eight a three input function with eight different um, eight potential different um, output combinations and just realize it with a smaller four to one multiplexer and again this is essentially always possible So I redrew the truth table here um, for convenient, uh, convenience. It's the same function that we've just seen on the previous slide. But now, obviously, you can't. You only have four input wires to the multiplexer, so you can't just take each row of the truth table individually and put, in, put the corresponding value in the function on one of the wires. Um, but one thing you can do is to essentially you know, still put some of the inputs, x and y, for example, on these controls. And then see you know, 
what you what you can do with the how you can deal with the rest. So let's say if x and y are zero, you're picking that top wire, and you can look, and these first two um, rows of the truth table conveniently they're both zero. So if I just put a zero here, independently of the value of z, you will get the correct output. Okay. Now the next row x is zero, y is one. It's not quite as convenient because now um, f actually changes value. But if you look at this carefully, you see that basically f, the output you can is just not z. Okay. So really, what you have here, if I put the input z here, well, then I will generate the correct value. Going down one further, so combination, so x is uh, x is zero, y is one. So the other way around, x is zero, x is one, y is zero. Then you can see that f is more or less just z in these two rows. And then in the third one, f is again not z. Okay. So with this trick, essentially, you've kind of used, you've been able to realize this truth table again on a multiplexer, even though you only were able to take two of the, the variables and put it onto, onto the controls. And again, this is something that's essentially always possible.